Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm going to try and keep this um, talk quite simple. And I'll try not to do too much of the basic uh, immunology and science behind this. So I was asked by uh, Professor Per Sorensen why we called it the Charcot Project. And the reason why we called it the Charcot Project, when you go back to Charcot's original description of MS, because he was the first person to link the clinical and the pathology together, and that's what defines a disease, he actually speculated that the uh, disease was caused by a virus. And so we thought it was only apt to uh, call the project, which is an antiviral project, uh, after him, as he was the first person in the literature to suggest it was a virus. So a large number of disclosures, some of them are relevant to this because we have been doing some antiviral trials. So I just want to give you the case for MS being uh, due to a virus because this may come out of the blue, but there is quite a significant number of people in the MS scientific community who think MS is caused by a virus. They tend to keep themselves quiet unless you bring them, bring them together. And once you bring them together, they talk about it a lot but a very few of them are prepared to uh, um, get up there and say MS is due to a virus, and I'm going to do that today. So we do know that MS is a complex disease, and I'm not going to go through this, but we, we know that there's a genetic susceptibility, but the genes are trumped by environment, and it's, it's quite clear from all the epidemiology studies the environment you live in is what causes this disease. And the important thing about the environment is that uh, these are modifiable, and that's why a lot of the environmental risk factors uh, should be looked at in much, much more detail because if we can prevent MS, uh, it's, it, in my opinion, that's where we should be going in prevention. And one of the things that we uh, uh, um, worry about is that there have been two classes of virus, the gamma herpes virus, Epstein-Barr, and endogenous retroviruses that have been linked to MS. And I'll spend some time talking about that. So this is the current dogma. Uh, and this is what we think happens with an individual MS lesion. You get the genetics, environment, and chance. We get an autoimmunity that triggers a focal inflammatory lesion that damages the oligodendrocyte axon that causes a clinical attack. It leaves behind damage, which causes disease progression, and we get recovery, and we can measure these with biomarkers. That's the current dogma. But what's missing is, is that all the inflammation could be secondary. And so what may be causing this is a primary viral infection of the oligodendrocyte, for example, and everything else is secondary. And there are clues in the literature to this. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other uh, bits of evidence in the background is there have been a numerous clusters of MS uh, reported. The most famous ones are from Faroe Islands. But uh, there's been too many clusters to ignore them. And so that's why infectious disease people think there's something uh, worth looking at. So you can dismiss each cluster based on ascertainment bias and all that. But there are too many of them to dismiss all of them. And then there's the Prinius lesion. So this is one of the most controversial pathologies in MS. But the, what you've got to realize, this is not one case. In this paper, there were 12 cases, not one case. So people dismiss this as being a case of not MS, but NMO. But hidden in there, there were 12 other cases. But this is a very sad story of a 17-year-old who had MS, who had a major brainstem relapse developed pulmonary edema, and died within 24 hours of onset. And when it came to pathology, she had this enormous demyelinating lesion in her brainstem. And the important thing about this lesion is that it was oligodendrocyte apoptosis. All the oligodendrocytes were dead. There was a bit of immunoglobulin complement activation, but there was no infiltrates in terms of T and BT uh, lymphocytes. So this was a, essentially a, almost a cellular apoptotic lesion. However, the rest of the lesions in her brain that were active were typical MS lesions full of T-cell infiltrates. And uh, John Prinius has put this forward as the initial MS lesion and uh, hypothesizing. And he doesn't say it in open meetings, but behind doors he thinks this is also due to a virus. And the uh, inflammation is secondary. <clears throat> so th if this is correct, then we've got to be thinking very differently about the pathogenesis of MS lesions. Now, there is MRI evidence to support this. So if you're involved in serial MRI studies, okay, and you pick up a gadolinium-enhancing lesion, which is the inflamed lesion that is associated with infiltrates, and you've got serial scans, if you go back to that area, you will see in the white matter where that lesion appears, there is changes on MTR okay, and diffusion-weighted imaging that occurs weeks to months before the inflammatory lesion appears. So based on MRI imaging, there's also something happening in the white matter 
prior to the inflammation. So this would also suggest the inflammation is coming secondary. Now you may disagree with this, but it's there. And then the other one is, <clears throat> and this has actually been well known, so when you look at natural history studies, so these are p studies of people with MS, relapses in MRI activity have been a very poor predictor of long-term outcome. And we kind of dismissed that, saying the natural history studies you know, weren't done well enough. And then we had this, and this is just one example. So this is actually the 15-year follow-up of the pivotal Avonex beta interferon trial. And what's important is in people that were on disease modifying treatments, interferon, if they had activity enhancing lesions, new T or relapses, they did much, much worse. So it actually predicted outcome on therapy. But in the placebo group, there was no correlation between activity and outcome. And so if you know anything about surrogate markers or what is a disease, it, it clearly tells you that the focal lesions and relapses is not the disease. Because if it was the disease, it would have to be predictive in both groups. <clears throat> so what it's telling us is that it's, the DMT isn't working, but it's not telling us anything about the MS. So, uh, and this, this is one example there, about five sets of examples in clinical trials in the literature, and you have to then interpret this as relapses and focal MRI activity is in response, probably, to the disease, and it is not the disease. <clears throat> and then the big thing comes from uh, natalizumab. So natalizumab is one of our most effective therapy, and as you know, it blocks trafficking of uh, the immune response particularly adaptive immune response, both T and B cells into the central nervous system. And people do extremely well on it. But when you stop the drug, uh, between 40 and 50% of people have this enormous rebound. In other words, they get an enormous amount of activity that's way and above what you expect based on their baseline characteristics. So something's happening inside the brain of people with multiple sclerosis uh, that natalizumab keeps the immune response from finding. You remove it, and you get this. Uh, and we, I kind of talk about this as being the field phenomenon. Uh, and we know that when you look at these lesions, they are full of typical uh, inflammatory infiltrates that you see in MS. So something's happening in the brain, okay, that the immune system has to see to cause the damage. Uh, some of you may have seen this case report. This was a tragic case of an Italian male who uh, was on natalizumab for three years, and because of depression, he decided to, he was very depressed, he stopped his treatment. He came in with a rebound. His MRI showed, you know, over 50 new T2 lesions that were mainly enhancing, and he died as a result of his uh, rebound. Um, they looked quite hard to see if this was PML. They couldn't find any JC virus, either in the CSF or in the tissue at post-mortem. But what they did find was uh, quite a large amount of EBV reactivation. Okay? There was a, a, a large amount of Epstein-Barr virus uh, found uh, in the uh, lesions of this patient, suggesting that maybe this rebound was due to Epstein-Barr virus. I'll come back to that. This is one case, and a swallow doesn't make a summer, so it's just something that needs to be kept in mind. So that brings us to which virus. <clears throat> And uh, of all the known viruses, the only one that really keeps coming up over and over again in all the studies is EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, and the real risk factor is infectious mononucleosis. So if you have glandular fever or infectious mono, it usually means late infection, because if you get infected with this virus early on in life, uh, you tend not to have symptoms. It puts up your risk by between two and two and a half times background. And this is a risk that's there for the rest of your life. <clears throat> We've actually shown, and this is just one example, um, there's a very close correlation between MS prevalence and infectious monoprevalence. And infectious mononucleosis actually follows a similar gradient away from the equator, latitudinal gradient, to multiple sclerosis. Okay? So the further north or the further south you go from the equator, the more likely you are to get uh, infectious mono. Now that may be linked to vitamin D metabolism because... Uh, people with lower vitamin D levels uh, have a higher incidence or high, um, of infectious mono. So it could be due to immune response to the virus. Anyway, this is just looking at uh, uh, inf infectious mono. This is a meta-analysis we did about seven, seven, well, eight years ago now. Um, and what you've got to realize is the odds ratio is quite small. So if you are involved in causation theory and you're interested in epidemiology, 
people will say this odds ratio is too small to be meaningful, but I would argue the opposite. I mean, uh, I will discuss Bradford Hill with you later, but uh, Bradford Hill, who was the doyen of uh, causation theory, you know, he likes odds ratios of 40, 40 and above. <laughs> Like with asbestosis, it's got an odds ratio of 200 as the cause of mesothelioma, and that's causation. But if you've got a common exposure, and EBV is a common exposure, most of us in this room will have had Epstein-Barr virus, a rare manifestation of a common exposure gives you a low odds ratio, and it can still be causal. So I don't want you to go away and say, well, this is, you know, the odds ratio is too small, because uh, it could still be causal, even at two. <clears throat> What's important, though, when you look at uh, um, the odds ratio, now this is a, a, a Berthe Scherer's meta-analysis. He puts the odds ratio, in other words, if you're EBV positive versus negative of getting uh, uh, MS is 13.5. You have, you have to exclude the ones where there's zero cases. So this is actually a, cons a very conservative estimate. Okay, so it's probably in the region of 40, if you could include these other studies. Now you flip the coin. And that's the real important information. The odds ratio, if you're at Epstein-Barr virus negative, in other words, you don't have the virus, the chance of you getting MS is close to zero. Actually, if you exclude the studies that just used serology and didn't use immune fluorescence to detect the virus, it would be zero. Zero. So to me, this is causation. In other words, if you want people to not get MS, you've got to stop them getting Epstein-Barr virus. And that's an experiment that we have to do. <clears throat> now, temporal sequence. It's very important that if you're putting forward an hypothesis that a virus causes MS, then everybody has to get the virus before they get the disease. Now, this is an incredibly difficult study to do. And Alberto Scheria's group were fortunate to have the serum bank of the US military. When you go into the US military, you get a serum sample taken almost every year, gets put into a freezer, and then you follow people up. And so he was able to identify, okay, identify a group of people <coughs> that uh, converted to, that uh, developed MS and converted to, and got MS later on. And when you actually look at them, these are the 10 cases. <coughs> every single one of the people that came into the US military being EBV negative and developed MS later on, they all seroconverted on their serum bank samples prior to the onset of the disease. So this is a very important study and unlikely to be reproduced in a hurry. So this actually ticks one of the most important criteria for causation. You have to be infected first before you get the disease. Now in the control group, only about 35% seroconverted. And this is highly, highly significant study, this. <clears throat> so evidence or lack of evidence. So the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. And everybody puts this thing up. This is the pediatric study. <laughs> this is the pediatric study from Canada showing you that in, in children there's a, with MS, there's a very close link uh, to EBV and MS, but it's not 100%. So if you can see over here, okay, uh, there's this gap. Okay? Not all the children with MS have the virus. Now let me explain to you that the study was done with simple uh, serology looking for EBNA1 and VCA, and we know that that's not the gold standard for detecting the virus. You need to do some more detailed serology. <clears throat> so first of all, I think the serology needs to be checked, and I've asked Brenda Banwell many times to send us the samples, but she won't. And I'll tell you why, because we did a CIS study. Uh, Jens Kulert, when he came, did a CIS study. And we had over 1,000 patients with CIS, and we found 32 of them were EBV negative. So we took those 32 negative samples on basic serology and we sent them to Jarp Middeldorp's laboratory in Amsterdam. Okay, and he's the world expert on EBV. And of those 32, 31 were positive and one was equivocal. So almost 100% of our patients were positive. And I think we need to check that. Also, if you know about pediatric neurology, it's, it's one of the most, it's, it's a difficult diagnosis to make. And so some of those patients may or may not have MS. In the German pediatric study, this is almost 100%, it's 99%. So uh, this is an outlier. And I don't think it disproves the hypothesis. So what about coherence with prior knowledge? I can't explain this. So EBV has to explain the migration pattern, uh, and it could be due to infectious mono. Uh, the rising incidence in women, uh, I don't know how EBV explains this. 
There's no evidence based on epidemiology of the virus that could explain the massive increase in incidence we're seeing in females. <clears throat> and similarly, I have no idea how we link smoking and Epstein-Barr virus infection together. And I think, you know, if we want to explain the hypothesis, we've got to explain these observations. <clears throat> we thought it could be HLA, and we did a study, uh, and this disproved the hypothesis in the sense that we thought the same HLA genes that predispose you to MS would predispose you to infectious mono, and it doesn't. Okay, they're a completely different set of HLA types. And this was done with Dorothy Crawford in Edinburgh. Uh, this was a university study where all students came in and all the EBV negatives, people who came to university, uh, were followed up prospectively. And those that got infectious mono versus those who were asymptomatic EBV, there was no, that's how we did the study. Biological plausibility. So there have been a few papers. This is one we were done, just showing you that when you look at EBNA1 titus, this is the uh, um, EBV nuclear antigen 1. Uh, IgG, levels of the antibody, in other words, the tighter the immune response against the uh, antigen predicts disease activity. <clears throat> um, there's been a lot of work done from Francesca Aloisi's group in Rome, showing that when you look at MS lesions and you look carefully, you can find a lot of EBV infection in each MS lesion. Now, this has been extremely controversial. And I say this because a lot of people have tried to reproduce this, is can you find the virus in MS lesions? And you can see there's many negative studies and there's some more recent positive studies. <clears throat> we tried to do this twice, so we, did, we collaborated with the Amsterdam Brain Bank, um, and that was with <clears throat> Paul van der Falk's group, and we couldn't reproduce it in the Amsterdam uh, brains. Uh, and then Uchamai and our group uh, did a detailed study with Margaret Aseri, and we were able to find in a small number of people with MS Epstein-Barr virus uh, activation <coughs> uh, in lesions. And we only could find them in acute lesions. We couldn't find them in chronic uh, or inactive lesions. Uh, what's important about the lesions that actually did express EBV, EBIS, is uh, the small RNA species at Epstein-Barr virus, indicating that there was EBV in the lesions. It was strongly correlated with upregulation of the type 1 antiviral response. <clears throat> and that characterized, so when you type the lesions based on a type 1 interferon response, in other words, an antiviral response, we could find the virus. In lesions that didn't have a type 1 interferon response, we couldn't find the virus. So I think there is some uh, a link that there may be, Epstein-Barr virus may be playing a role within the central nervous system. But again, it doesn't have to. Uh, it could be driving the disease all from the periphery. Another hypothesis that's been put forward, uh, you all know that oligoclonal, the immunoglobulin bands, these are IgG bands, are a pathognomonic feature of MS. And there's always been the hypothesis that if you find the cause of MS, these bands have to bind to the causative agent. Uh, but I can say to you quite categorically, and we've tried this ourselves many times, different techniques, we cannot remove the oligoclonal IgG bands with EBV proteins. So these bands... Um, in my opinion, are not uh, targeting the Epstein-Barr virus. Mm. Another part of causation is analogy. So the best analogy comes from this study. So this is actually, if anybody's interested in animal models of MS, this has to be the best animal model. So this is actually a species, uh, a colony of macaques that live in Oregon. Uh, and the NIH is funding this, and they've been wanting to close down this colony for years. So the more you collaborate with this group, the more chance they've got of keeping the funding alive to keep this colony around. But these animals come down with a spontaneous demyelinating disease. About 4% of the animals per annum come down with this. Um, not induced, spontaneous. And under the microscope, it looks, and with MRI, it looks just like MS. And when the vet, you know, this is a vet pathologist, looked at the tissues and said, guys, this is an encephalitis. There must be a virus here. And they did a lot of deep sequencing, and they looked for They couldn't find the virus at all. So the vet said, look, let's go back to old techniques. And they took a slice of brain from one of these animals that they had to cull, and they passaged it, culturing it on another brain slice. And it took them about seven or eight passages to grow virus out of this tissue. And you know what the virus was? It's a virus that infects primates, but it's a gamma herpes virus. Now, why is that important? Because if, it's important because Epstein-Barr virus is a gamma herpes virus. So we do have a disease in animals, I think, that mimics MS 
due to a virus, okay? And uh, so that's why I'm, uh, I always quote this animal study. Uh, uh, this animal model has been very suggestive that we have a, a spontaneous disease in, in nature that looks like MS. Another disease is HDLB1 myelopathy. I haven't got time to go through. This used to be misclassified, particularly in Western countries, uh, as being MS, primary progressive disease. And it was only when the epidemiology emerged and we found the virus, it's a retrovirus, that we could actually say that HTLV1, or tropical spastic paraparesis, as it's known in the tropics, okay, is a different disease. Uh, and I actually diagnosed two people uh, in, uh, that had been misclassified uh, in my practice over the last 25 years as primary progressive disease. They actually have this condition. So this condition mimics MS very closely. Experimental evidence. So I put this up so you all know about anti-CD20. It's the uh, big story in the last five years in MS. This is a very effective disease-modifying therapy. This is looking at a uh, number of lesions. This is looking at number of new lesions. You can see how effective rituximab is at suppressing. And did you know that rituximab is the only licensed anti-EBV drug we have? Okay, it's licensed to treat Epstein-Barr virus associated lymphoproliferative disease, and if you look at EV viral loads, when you give rituximab, they go from there down to being undetectable. So this is a pretty potent, anti-CD20 is a pretty potent anti-EVV drug. Okay, I've asked Genentech and I've asked Roche hundreds of times to please look <clears throat> in the ocrelizumab program at EVV virology and biology, and I keep hitting a blank wall, okay? I don't think the industry wants to know that anti-B cell therapies are working as anti-EBV drugs. So we actually done a meta-analysis uh, recently. And the question is, is how, if, if, if um, MS is due to Epstein-Barr virus, surely the, the therapies should all be working against it. And uh, David Baker went into the literature and pulled all this together with us. Uh, and it's quite clear that all the treatments that work in MS actually reduce memory B cells some to a greater or lesser extent. And why I say memory B cells are important, because that's where Epstein-Barr virus becomes latent, and that's where Epstein-Barr virus resides, in the memory B cell compartment. The two exceptions are atacicept and anti-TNF and fliximab. They both increase disease activity, and interestingly enough, they both boost memory B cell responses. Memory B cells go up. So here's some anecdotal evidence that uh, uh, MS disease-modifying therapies may be working against the the uh, uh, B cell compartment where the viral virus lives. The exception is obviously natalizumab, but as I said to you earlier, natalizumab doesn't reduce memory B cells, it stops the trafficking. So it is consistent with the hypothesis. Anyway, I haven't got time, but if anyone you're interested in you, there is an incredible literature of how EBV affects B cell biology, and I think that's where we should be looking as immunologists, if anybody's in this audience. Uh, and uh, almost certainly the clue to how EBV triggers or causes MS lies inside the B cell. Anyway, so these are Bradford Hill's criteria for causation. You don't have to tick them all, but if you go through all these criteria, and if anyone wants these slides, they're welcome to have them. Okay. Uh, uh, based on uh, Bradford Hill, I am convinced Epstein-Barr virus is the cause of MS, but I still don't know how it causes the disease. That doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be studying it. So the next thing is the dual viral hypothesis. Uh, uh, and we put this paper out. This was a colleague of mine from Australia who came to me and said, yeah, I've got this case. This, this guy had EV, uh, quite bad MS, uh, and he got HIV infection. Uh, and then he was put on a highly antiretroviral. Anti he wasn't treated for his MS, interestingly. He was in, a, in an era when there wasn't much DMTs. Okay, and he was put on highly antiretrovirals, and his MS went away. Stopped his MS completely. So we published this case, and then we got email after email. I'm just going to give you an example. I won't go through all these. We got email after email after email of people with exactly the same story. These are people with MS who got HIV, went on to highly antiretrovirals, and their disease went away or stopped. We said, well, what the hell's happening? So we went to the literature, and at the same time, the, da the Danes were pu published this paper just showing you that uh, if you have HIV, it protects you from getting MS. It wasn't significant. So we went into our English uh, records and we found exactly the same thing. If you get diagnosed with HIV in, in, uh, in, in England, the chance of you getting MS <clears throat> drops quite substantially. And it's got to do with timing. 
So the, you know, if you're uh, less than 45 years of age, uh, um, uh, you can see the uh, relative risk drops quite substantially. So the question is, how does HIV infection protect you from getting MS? Anyway, this has been, re uh, there's two other, two other groups that have actually got the same data. They haven't published. One is the U uh, US veterans. They've got the same thing. They've got, in people that are HIV positive, a lower incidence of MS than you'd expect based on the control population. And another group is the Kaiser Permanente in California. In their database, they've got exactly the same. They've only got six cases of MS and HIV, and they would expect 35 based on background uh, incidence rates of multiple sclerosis. So I do think this is a real finding, and the Swedes are trying to reproduce this as well, and I just hope the Swedish data shows the same thing. <clears throat> anyway, we actually went into the literature, and there's a big literature on how uh, retroviruses, particularly human endogenous retroviruses, cause and trigger autoimmunity. Um, for those of you who know, there's a well-known molecular mechanism. If, if your herbs, your endogenous retroviruses, which are these retroviruses that live in our genome, 6% of your genome is endogenous retroviruses. <clears throat> uh, and mutations in these sensing pathways cause a condition called uh, a, 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 um, a Gutierrez syndrome. And this is a, kid, a disorder of kids where they get multiple autoimmune diseases. So if you can't suppress endogenous retroviruses, you get autoimmunity. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, Hervé Perron has been studying this, this association between herbs and MS, and there's a big literature on the pathology, peripheral blood, and he actually thinks the way uh, endogenous retroviruses trigger MS is that one of the envelope proteins acts as a danger signal. It's, it's, it acts, it's agonist for toll-like receptor 4, and he's actually got a company, and there's a phase 2B study going on now on an antibody targeting this envelope protein to try and treat MS. And I won't go into that. <clears throat> Anyway, we do know, based on quite a lot of evidence, that antiretrovirals that are used for HIV may work in suppressing endogenous retroviruses, and that's the hypothesis we put forward. Could we treat people with antiretroviral therapy and treat MS? <clears throat> Another observation, this comes from Sardinia, just showing you that actual MS interferon, this interferon, this natalizumab, also reduces uh, activation of herbs. And what's EBV got to do with herbs? Well, Epstein-Barr virus is the most common transactivator of endogenous retroviruses. Anyway, we went around the world trying to get the pharmaceutical companies interested in doing a heart trial. No. But we got one of them interested. It was Merck MSD, and they allowed us to do a trial of Raltegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor. It's the most downstream antiviral drug you can use. And uh, unfortunately, our trial was negative. Anyway, just to conclude then, um, we're still very keen on doing a proper heart trial. We may have one company interested in sponsoring this trial. We're still working on them. Uh, we're working in close collaboration with uh, the NIH, the, uh, Jeffrey Cohen's group. They're developing an EB vaccine. And I've got two pharma companies interested in developing EBV vaccines. So we are going to be testing, hopefully in the next 10 years, uh, a vaccine study to prevent MS. We're also working on a, on a protocol to treat IM, so we've got an antiviral that we think will treat IM to see if we can reduce endophenotype. And clearly we need to go to MS and think about what can we do if, MS, if Epstein-Barr virus is continuing to play a role in the pathogenesis of MS treating EBV. Anyway, I just want to leave off with uh, Arthur Schopenhauer's dictum. Uh, often new ideas are ridiculed, they're often violently opposed, and eventually they accept it as self-evident. I hope we're in the violently opposed group still. Uh, I have been through the ridicule phase, to be honest with you. And I hope in 10 years' time you'll all accept this as being self-evident. And you know about black swans? If you want to read a book called The Black Swan, it's about the improbable things happen more common than you realize. And I can give you examples in the field of medicine where strange ideas, okay, in retrospect, prove to be very insightful. So if you go away from this meeting, I just hope you go away that one day maybe you'll all say Epstein-Barr virus is obviously the cause of multiple sclerosis. I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you.